All right, uh, welcome back to Point of Care Ultrasound. We're going to start um, going through some different cases. Hopefully we can do this bi-monthly uh, to start out with. And these are essentially just going to be cases um, that uh, either we've seen or somebody sent in and uh, would like us to discuss. Um, this week we're going to be discussing a case of res respiratory distress. Uh, I've got Dr. Uh, Krista Groh with me. She's one of our chief residents here um, at our hospital. And... Uh, She's going to discuss a case that she's seen recently with us um, and the use of bedside ultrasound in that case. So um, go ahead and let her take over here for a minute. Thank you. So this was a 70-year-old man that I heard the EMS call come through um, in respiratory distress. When they got there, his O2 sats were in the upper 80s. Uh, had a history of COPD, so they had given him a couple breathing treatments in route, and his oxygen had improved with that but remained in, in some respiratory distress. So I met this gentleman at the bedside and um, did confirm the history of COPD, confirmed that he had had about three days of a cough and trouble breathing, said he did have a productive cough, was bringing up some brown sputum. He had tried some of his home inhalers and had continued to get worse throughout the night, so that's what sparked the EMS call that day. So when I walked into the room and uh, saw this gentleman, uh, uh, he was tachycardic, he was tachypneic, EMS was there and had him on a non-rebreather, and his oxygen uh, was slightly low uh, despite the, the treatments in the non-rebreather. He was not febrile, um, otherwise blood pressure looked okay, but he did look to be in moderate respiratory distress. On exam um, as well, he, he was um, tachypneic using his accessory muscles and had diminished breath sounds throughout, but also significant wheezing throughout. What were your initial thoughts then, seeing him like this? So initially I was definitely just thinking that this guy was uh, probably a COPD exacerbation, some kind of bronchitis with the coughing up the mucus. Um, the fact that he had improved with the breathing treatments was definitely, definitely leading me more towards a COPD route. Um, however, he had kind of been on his breathing treatments, wasn't getting better, and um, the mucus seemed to be a very new thing for him. Other than that, though, he was afebrile. He didn't really have a ton of risk factors to really have an infectious cause, but he had been feeling a little lightheaded, kind of had a pre-syncopal sort of event that morning at home. So um, clearly something a little bit more distressful to him than just his typical sort of COPD symptoms. It was a, if I remember right, it was a pretty precipitous um, decompensation, right? He had seen his doctor the day before, and um, if I recall... Yeah, he did, and I think they put him on steroids, and they, they had given him the breathing treatments, and he had seen his doctor. No imaging or lab work was done at that time, but I just put him on the COPD treatments, and he said he just continued to get worse overnight despite that treatment for COPD. Great. So what uh, you're, you're sitting there at bedside. He's in respiratory distress, and you, you mentioned uh, COPD was one of your leading concerns. What uh, what did you decide to do at that time? Just kind of walked us through your thought process and what you did. So as with every critical patient that comes in, you know, thinking um, through our ABCs, um, attached this gentleman to the monitor. We got our nurses to establish IVs for him, um, contacted our respiratory therapist to come continue breathing treatments um, on our machines, um, talked about his lung exam. You know, he had bilateral breast sounds. He, um, so kind of pneumothorax was lower on my list at that point since he did have bilateral breast sounds. Um, but uh, he was talking to me, um, although he was in distress, he, his airway was patent, um, and his blood pressure and everything were normal. So just got him the IVs, got him on the monitor, and getting our respiratory therapist in to give him some treatments. Great. And then uh, then we started with uh, bedside ultrasound. Was to grab the bedside ultrasound here. Our differential is pretty broad with um, his history of COPD. Our first concern was to, to look for a pneumothorax. So here we have our um, curvilinear probe um, in the right apex. Um, our pro marker is towards the head. Um, we have rib shadowing here on either side with our lung sliding, showing that hyperechoic lung sliding right here in the middle. So this slide showing no evidence of a pneumothorax in that right apex. Okay, and then we also did a M mode. Can you kind of explain that to us? So our M mode we did it shows the sort of what's the sandy sandy Sand beach, beach. <laughs> sandy beach sign. Um, so all this right here showing that kind of sandy beach appearance. Um, that shows that there is no more facts in this patient. So this pleural line, this white line here for everybody, uh, if you watch the lung ultrasound lecture, it talks about the pleural line being here and up here, and so you can see it. Uh, the gain could be a little lower here for us, or I mean a little increased here to appreciate it, but we can see the shimmy of the lungs here. So. 
Okay, moving on. So our next move was to, to come down the chest and just look at his uh, right anterior lower chest. Um, this time we're seeing again these rib, the rib shadowing right here and in between here's our um, pleural line with uh, these kind of comet tails or B lines here. We see at least two to three of these uh, B lines shadowing down the chest in each rib space. Um, so that did make us uh, concerned for a pulmonary vascular congestion of some type in this rib space, given these B lines here. Yeah, so I mean, I think that's the important thing to note here is we didn't see them in the apex, and we're seeing them in a focal area. Now we'll obviously I'll continue with the rest of the exam and, and see if we can appreciate those. Um, is there anything that's running through your mind at this point when you're looking at this this one view? Um, so given that we only found it here on the one side, does make me more worried for a focal consolidation. Um, however, we'll see what the left side of the chest looks like. Still could be some sort of diffuse pattern like a um, CHF or volume overload. But sure, yeah. yeah. I mean, as we get closer to those bases, we should we expect to see that a little bit more. So it'll be interesting to see what we see on the on the left side here. So our left um, apex, again, we're looking for um, the lung sliding right here, which we see. And um, we do have one or maybe two sort of beelines or comet tails here in this space, um, but definitely not as much as we were seeing over on the right side and and maybe technically not enough to actually call it as have two to three per rib space. Yeah, to really. so having one focal beeline is what it looks like there to me. You know, we could all, healthy individuals could have that. So that may or may not be pathology or suggestion of pathology at that right now, but um, we'll just have to move forward and see. Okay, so we move down the left chest. Um, here again, we see our pleural line with rib sliding, and here we see no bee lines or comet tails, so no signs of any kind of pulmonary vascular congestion right here on our left lower chest. Okay, great. So, um, so next then we, we move to the lateral side. Um, here we have the right lateral side of this patient up in the axilla, um, and again, we're seeing those rib spaces in the pleural line, and here again we get maybe one little B line coming down for this patient in our um, right axilla. And I think it's important as we look at this, uh, with our probe mark, our probe on in the mid axillary line is where we do that at our institution. The probe marker is towards the head, and so this is going to be towards your head and towards your feet. And if we remember, we saw it in the left, or I mean the right lower anterior chest. So this is going to be our lower mid axillary line as we as we scan down. So I think that's important to reflect. We may be um, coming down to our same uh, rib space as we saw the, the lung rockets in. Okay. So then moving down to that, that right lateral chest where we were maybe concerned about some pathology based on the anterior pictures. Here we have our liver. We have um, the, uh, the diaphragm. diaphragm. <laughs> yeah, that's what that's called. The diaphragm, our hyperechoic line right here. Um, and then at this time, wasn't really sure what was obscuring that view at this point. So, um, so moving on to a couple more pictures of that area. Still wasn't quite sure what I was seeing again in this area. Definitely knew this didn't look like a normal type of lung right here, um, but wasn't entirely sure what I was what I was seeing at this point. So. Yeah, I think that's good. Um, you know, as you, you come down, and, and I like that you guys identified your liver here, um, as you slid back up and realized there was something here you didn't recognize, um, you know, being early on in your career is just identifying things that you don't, are abnormal, you know, um, and then you can explore that further with the help of other physicians or other studies, but uh, we can obviously look further and see what we can find here. Yep, so we've got a couple more pictures of it, um, and... Yeah, so right here, this is more difficult uh, to see. Um, I don't know, we'll see if some brightness on the screen helps. Yeah. Um, but we have our... Uh, some pleural line here and kind of here it gets a little ratty and you can see down through here that you get a little bit of speckling um, and uh, what starts to take on the look of a solid organ and we're up above the diaphragm here now now these are air bronchograms um, and that's what you know some of you probably heard the the term hepatization um, and that's what those air bronchograms are doing is they're creating hepatization and we see the lung start to look like a solid organ um, and that's what we're seeing here in this image. It's a it's a dirty image because, but we knowing where we are on the body and what we've done, uh, we can tell that this is lung at this point. And this is a little bit more of um, the same. We're just seeing through that rib space a little bit better. And this is you know not not normal looking lung. We don't have a video here, but we we can take solid 
uh, or uh, steel clips because this is you know just a solid looking mass up in the in the chest now. Um, so we'll move forward here. There's our best one. Why don't you explain, yeah, describe that one? I think that one helped. Yeah, you I think this one definitely made it a little bit more clear to me. So you could definitely see the lung or the liver right here, uh, your diaphragm here, and then on the cephalod cephalod from your diaphragm, definitely just looked like a second kind of liver hanging out up here. So, um, so that hep hepatization of the lung that I'm seeing right here, which yes. made me concerned for a focal consolidation right there. Okay. So the the thing to remember as you look at this one is. Those initial lung rockets and V-lines uh, most likely represent your infiltrate, right? You talked about it being a vascular problem. It is. The, the vascular membrane breaks down, fluid leaks into it, and infection. Um, and so that's why you're seeing those V-lines focal or localized. And then this is obviously a progression of that disease where there's enough fluid in there to make it look like a solid organ. So why don't we go ahead and see what the left side showed us here. So in our left uh, mid-axillary line, um, and again, probe marker up towards the head right here. Um, see our, our pleural line right here, and really no pathology noted on this slide. Okay. Um, so came down the chest on that side. Um, again, we see our lung sliding of our pleural line, and really no significant pathology here on the left side either. Okay. I think we got one final here, just at the diaphragm. I think our diaphragm was hard to get on this side, if I remember, and mm -hmm. I couldn't quite see the spleen, but we can at least see our lung coming down and our, our uh, abdominal contents here. So. Uh, no large effusion that we could see over there. So it looks like most of our pathology was localized to that right lower lung. Did you say right. that's right? Correct. Yeah. Right. So for tradition of medicine, we went ahead and got a uh, chest x-ray. <laughs> and uh, this is what our chest x-ray looked like. So I think quite representative, right? Yeah. Of that's what fun. we were seeing. So we saw a lot of this infiltrate here, and then we have that solid organ or consolidation all through here. Um, and interestingly, uh, you know, we got antibiotics started early, but the gentleman became febrile uh, about a half an hour into his stay. Mm -hmm. So so the question that you and I had and discussed was, um, why do lung ultrasound um, when we're going to do a chest x-ray? What can you tell us in this case, or what, what's your mm -hmm. thoughts on that, Dr. Groom? Yeah, so in this case, it was kind of a um, busy night in the ER as well, and we actually had a really difficult time getting the um, x-ray techs to come get the x-ray. I think there were multiple other traumas in critical patients at the same time that the portable x-ray was taken up for. So in our situation, it was uh, very convenient even just to pull the ultrasound in and sort of in within a, a couple minutes time span, we had ruled out a pneumothorax in this gentleman, uh, ruled out any kind of um, pleural effusions. Um, so we saw that he definitely had the lung sliding for no pneumothorax. We saw that he had this focal consolidation kind of on the right side and uh, with his clinical picture of coughing up more sputum failing that course of COPD treatment as an outpatient definitely started leading us immediately more towards a septic fish picture for this gentleman um, and we're able to get our antibiotics going even before he had this x-ray done. Yeah, I think that's great. I think we got our antibiotics going before an hour and we were able to, t to tailor those antibiotics to, um, to his uh, specific uh, infection based off the lung, ultra or the lung ultrasound. And I think it was, if I remember our timeline right, was at least an hour in between the uh, the lung ultrasound and the chest x-ray, mm -hmm. and then by the time we, um, we were, it was at night, so obviously you're not going to get a radiologist read. You're still held responsible for the chest x-ray, so, uh, or, sorry, it was a weekend, not a night, um, so we were able to, you know, just get everything set and, and going, so. Um, I think this is a good picture to end on. Um, here we just want to, you know, just reiterate that uh, here's your liver on this side, here's your diaphragm coming up, and then it looks like you have liver up here, hepatization, and that's your air bronchograms. Um, you know, I think you're not going to see that in every patient with pneumonia because it may be early, it may just be focal B lines. Um, but I think it's a way to, to, to find a, a diagnosis early. There's a study out earlier this year um, that I'll provide a link to that talks about being able to get to the diagnosis with point of care ultrasound um, within the first 10 minutes. And then uh, I think they had a uh, 90, uh, I won't go through the accuracies, I'll let you guys read that. but. Um, was significantly better in diagnosing uh, the cause of sepsis in patients um, versus traditional um, imaging. Uh, so I think that's useful. And then also there's a good uh, study out there, the blue protocol that was appeared in the ch uh, chest journal a few years back by uh, Lichtenstein. Um, and that's very good for you, or very useful for uh, lung ultrasound. So any closing thoughts or? That's a good case. It's the first time I've ever seen this on ultrasound before. So 
extremely useful to run through our differentials for this gentleman. Well, thanks for joining us today, and hopefully that was helpful. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to let us know or interesting cases you'd like to share also.